If you have your Bible, please open with me to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. I just want to praise God for the wonderful work that he has done ultimately in sending his only begotten son into this world to die on the cross for sinners like you and I. But I just want to especially thank him for this great work he's done in the household of Solomon and Saini Bloomfield. He has blessed them so much. Um, I just thank God for their courageous testimonies, for their honesty. Uh, this is all of us, what they said. We are brought up, even when we're brought up in the church, we have a, a sinful nature, we have the temptations of the world, uh, but God, in his perfect timing, brought them to repentance and faith, radically changed them, and has blessed them, given them peace and joy in their home, and blessed them with a, a beautiful and wonderful son, Hassani, And I just praise God as I observe the great work that he has began, that he continues to do, and that he's going to do in the future in this precious family. Um, Sister Saini shared um, her verse uh, at the end of her testimony, and that was Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. So I just want to share the word of God from this one verse this morning. So if you look with me there in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, If you have your Bible, you can uh, see it in your own Bible or it's on the screen. So Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Notice with me as I read the verse, you'll see there seven times the personal pronoun I or me. Or four times the Apostle Paul says I and three times he says me. That's seven personal pronouns in one verse. And this is not because Paul is making himself the hero of this verse, but he is pointing to Christ like what he said elsewhere, I am what I am by the grace of God. And he just says this in a personal way. It's not like abstract. It's not like Jesus died 2,000 years ago um, for somebody else. He's saying Jesus died for me. And what I want to to um, ponder on this morning is this. What is true of the Apostle Paul in this verse is true of every child of God. So look with me this verse, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. The Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I, notice the personal pronouns, no longer I who live but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This time I invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for who you are, for the work of your hands. We're thankful, Father, that you sent your only begotten Son into this world to seek and save a people like us, lost sinners, sinners who have lost our way in this world. We're so thankful for our Lord and Saviour, for his miraculous virgin birth. We're thankful that he became one of us to make us one with you. Thankful for his perfect life and for his death on the cross for our sins in our place, for my sins in my place. We're so thankful for this great work that you have done in the life, in the household of Solomon and Saini Bloomfield, bringing them to that sacred place in that sacred moment of time. You brought them to repentance and faith and they've committed their life to you, Lord God. We're thankful for your great salvation that you purchased for them on the cross and that they have experienced through repentance and faith. Pray for each precious soul here this morning, Lord God, for especially any precious soul that has not yet committed their life to you, that have not yet come to this sacred place of repentance and faith that you would open their heart this morning, that you would bring them to their knees. Even the children of this church, those that have been raised in this church, Lord God, may you show them your command 
that they need to repent and believe the gospel. We pray this for your honour and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Notice with me Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, how Paul says there, I have been. This is written in the past tense. In other words, it's not something that I do in the future. It's something that has been done in the past. It's something that Jesus did on the cross. Notice how it says, I have been crucified with Christ. Now, of course, Paul is not saying that he was literally crucified with Jesus. Obviously, as he's writing these words many years after the crucifixion of Christ, what Paul is saying is that when Jesus died on that cross, he died in my place for my sins. Paul's sins and the sins of all the people of God were placed on Jesus on the cross. And it is in this sense that Paul and all the children of God have been crucified with Christ. In this mystical and spiritual sense, when Jesus died, I died. Jesus died for our sins and therefore our old self, the old person that was a slave to sin, that old sinner that lived a life of sin, died on the cross when he died for my sins. The old person we used to be when we were living in sin has been crucified on the cross. And at the same time, we have been given new, a new life, a new spiritual life. He has regenerated us. He has caused our spiritual birth. We have become born again by the power of the Spirit of God because of the death of Christ. The old life, that old sinner, that old man that I used to be has been crucified and never to come back again, and the new life has come. Notice how Paul says this same truth in Romans chapter 6, the passage that our brother Alfred read for us. Look with me in Romans chapter 6, verse 3. He says there to the children of God, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized, the word baptized in the original Greek language that the New Testament was written in, on its own literally means immersed. Usually when we hear of baptism, we think of water baptism because in our English usage, it exclusively refers to water baptism. But in the original writing of the New Testament, it could be used to refer to water baptism, but it could be used to refer to, in a general sense, an immersion or to be immersed, to be like um, possessed by something or someone, to be unified, to become one with something. So when Paul uses it in Romans chapter 6, it's not talking about water baptism. It's talking about our spiritual baptism. Notice with me, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized, literally meaning as were immersed, our spiritual baptism, as were immersed into Christ, were baptized or immersed into his death. In other words, when he died, we died. We became one and part of his death. Look with me, verse 4. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into his death. So when he died, we were one with his death. We were immersed in his death because he died for my sins in my place. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Being dead and buried with Christ speaks of the death of our old life because our sin was placed on him. And being raised with Christ speaks of our new life in Christ. That is, his righteousness was placed in us. Look at me, verse 5. For if we have been united, remember, immerse, united, becoming one. If we have been united in the likeness of his death, Certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. And notice with me verse 6. 
This is exactly what Paul's saying in Galatians 2.20. Notice how he says it in verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man, our old life of sin, that old person I was before God saved me and radically changed me, before he gave me a spiritual new life, before he caused me to become a new person, Knowing this, that old man was crucified with him. That's what it means when Paul says, I am crucified or have been crucified with Christ. That old man was crucified with him. That the body of sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves of sin. Notice verse 7. For he who has died has been freed from sin. What the word of God is saying is that when Jesus died on the cross in my place for my sin, he saved me not only from the penalty of sin. In other words, he didn't die on the cross just to give me a ticket to go to heaven and in the meantime I just continue living a sinful worldly life. No, his grace is way more powerful than that. He died on the cross to save me from the penalty and power of sin. Or uh, as the Word of God puts it here, we should no longer, in verse 6, we should no longer be slaves to sin. Sin shall no longer have dominion over us, no longer has the power over us. Delivers us. He saved us from the penalty and power of sin. That sinful old life no longer has that addictive power over us. Look at me, verse 8. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. In these verses, we see that we have been crucified with Christ, buried with Christ, raised with Christ, and now live a godly life in the power of Christ. Look with me, our main verse again, Galatians 2.20. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. That old life has been dealt with on the cross. I have been crucified with Christ. Notice what he goes on to say. It is no longer I who live. It's no longer that old man that lives. I'm no longer addicted to that old life of sin. It's no longer this old person that's living out this life. But Christ lives in me. That old person I used to be is dead. And the new man in Christ Jesus, this new spiritual man that Christ has birthed, has come. Notice with me how the Apostle Paul says this truth in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. He says that, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. The old life of sin is gone. Behold, all things have become new. The Apostle Paul used to be a Pharisee. A Pharisee that was dependent on his own righteousness to earn favor with God. A Pharisee that boasted in his keeping of the law and believed that by keeping the law, one could earn favor with God. That's what he used to be. He used to also be, this is what he said of himself, he used to also be a blasphemer, a persecutor of the church of God, and an insolent man, in other words, a violent man. But because of what Jesus did on the cross for him, and the power of the Holy Spirit that saw him and knocked him off his high horse, I mean, the Apostle Paul was on his way from Jerusalem, on his high horse to Damascus to persecute Christians. But God, in his mercy and grace, through his spirit, intervened and radically changed him. Gave him a new heart. And with that new heart came new desires, a new passion. He went, went from being an, a violent man, a persecutor of the church of God, a selfish man, A man that was a slave to sin, even though he was self-righteous. To being a man that was obsessed with living for Christ and Christ alone, to the point where he said, as a changed man, 
He said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. In other words, every hour of every minute that Jesus gives me is all lived for him, for his honor and for his glory to the point of death. Solomon testified how even though he was raised in church, and this is like me, and this is like all of us who are raised in church. I mean, it's a wonderful blessing to be raised in church, but being raised in church does not automatically make us Christians. We all have a sin nature. And so until God does that regenerating work and brings us to faith and repentance, he testified that even though he was Raised in church, he hit his, hit his teen years and, and started living a, a worldly life and, and found the things of God boring and found church boring. This is like me. This is what my experience is being raised in church. I found it boring, but it wasn't until God radically saved him and changed him and brought him to repentance and faith that the new man has come and the old man has gone. He testifies because of God's saving grace that now he doesn't find church boring anymore. Now he prays together with his family. He doesn't do these things to earn favor with God. He does these things because God has blessed him with his favor. He's changed his heart. These are works of gratitude. Now, Sister Saini courageously and transparently testified of her life before God saved her. She spoke of that emptiness, that rottenness, that helplessness, that hopelessness. She spoke how she sought to fill that void through the things of this world. She also spoke about how when Christ saved her, he radically changed her because he changed her heart. And because he changed her heart, her desires changed. She said that the places she used to go, she no longer goes to. The places that she used to desire, she no longer desires. And I was an eyewitness. We are an eyewitness of the change in Solomon and Saini's life. She loves, he loves the word of God. What amazing love. What amazing grace that our great God does in the life of his children Look with me, Galatians 2.20 again. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. No longer that old person I used to be. That old person is no longer running my life. But Christ in me. He is my Lord and my Savior. He is now the ruler of my life. He is the one that's now influencing my life. He's the one that's given me the new heart and the new desire to live that life that he has demanded of me. Not only died for us to give us this new spiritual life that lasts for all eternity, but he indwells us and he empowers us and he enables us to live out this new spiritual life. And it's important for me to note the means of how we live out this new life in Christ. What does it mean that I no longer live, but now Christ lives in me? How does God do this? What is the means of God in doing this great work? I'll say this, it's not through the like robotic means. He doesn't like make me docile when he saves me. And then I'm like sort of a robot that lives out this Christian life. No, the means of God is that he saves me from the penalty and power of sin, gives me a new heart, gives me new desires, desires enables me, empowers me 
to live out this godly life that he instructs me to live out in his words. Gives me the power of his spirit to live the godly life that he has put before me. Of course, we do not obey the moral commandments of God to be saved. This is the whole point of Galatians. That is, the keeping of the law is not what saves us. It's Christ and Christ alone. But because of his grace and because of what he did on the cross and because of his regenerating work and because he's given us a new heart, we obey the moral commandments of God because we love him. We don't do it to earn favor with him. We do it because we have his favor freely bestowed on us. Look with me again at this sacred and beautiful verse. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Paul is saying I live out this new spiritual life by faith. That is, by trusting, depending leaning and relying on the power of Christ. We are saved by grace through faith and we're also sanctified by grace through faith. Look with me at the verse again. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God. And notice with me, beloved brothers and sisters, friends and family, notice who loved me. Wow, what a word. Who loved me. What amazing love. This is agape love. This is unconditional love. Who loved me. And how did he love me? He gave himself for me. You know, Jesus was no victim on that cross. Jesus said clearly that I am the one that lays down my life and I am the one that raises it again. He had the power, not Pilate. He's the one that laid down his life. Why? Because he loved me. Think about it with me, dear precious soul. As Saini testified, we are all void and restless without Christ. There is something inside all of us that has a need to be loved. No one wants to be hated. No one wants to be lonely. The problem is this, because we are sinners by nature, by nature we seek the things of this world to fill that void. We seek the things of this world to get acceptance, to make a name for ourselves. We have these grand, selfish ambitions and dreams. And we go for them. And then we find that we do not find fulfillment. Look, the reality is, even when we seek fulfillment, even in the good things that God blesses us with, things such as getting married, sometimes we think, well, just if I get married, then I'll find that fulfillment. And marriage is a a beautiful thing, a gift from God. But it doesn't fill that void that's caused by sin. It doesn't deal with my sin problem. It is dangerous to try to find that fulfillment in your spouse. You are putting a pressure on them that they are not made to bear. That's going to cause frustration in your marriage. It's Christ and Christ alone who gave himself for his bride the church. And I just have an open question for each and every one of you, dear precious souls. Have you experienced this transformative 
love of God. I'm talking predominantly to people who have been raised in church. I'm talking about people that have been raised in this church or perhaps people that have been raised in other churches. It runs in the family. We're all family. We all go back to Adam and Eve. As I said, it's a wonderful thing to be raised in church, but being raised in church does not make me a Christian. It's Christ and Christ alone. It's what he did on the cross. And we experience this salvation. We experience the love of God when the Holy Spirit opens our heart as he did with Lydia, brings us to our knees in repentance and faith. My question is, have you experienced the love of God? Have you come to repentance and faith? Have you experienced what Sani and Solomon experienced? That radical change of heart. I, like all of us, was raised in this world and born a sinner and also goofed off in my teens and got up to many worldly and wicked things, even though I was raised in church. But it wasn't until God just done a radical change of, of heart, change of desire and And the things I used to find exciting, like the pubs and clubs and parties and, you know, the selfish ambitions and the desire to be um, selfishly rich and all the sort of pursuits of this world that I used to think were going to fill that void were all gone. I realized that it's all about Christ and Christ alone. He is the giver of eternal life. He has the words of eternal life. I was convinced by the words of Jesus, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his own soul? Have you experienced this love? Have you come to repentance and faith? If you haven't, I beg you, dear precious soul, to repent and believe the gospel. And don't delay because you are not guaranteed to live tomorrow. This time, let us bow our heads and close our eyes for a word of prayer. Just want to give you a few moments, dear precious soul. You who have not yet experienced this great change, this great love of God. God has opened your heart. God has convicted you of your sin. Why don't you respond to the grace of God? He demands, it's a commandment, that you repent and believe the gospel. And unless you repent and believe, Jesus says you will perish. In other words, if you die without Christ, if you die having not come to repentance and faith, you will be eternally separated from Christ for all eternity in a place that the Bible describes as hell. A horrible place. For those who repent and believe, the promise is eternal life. Eternal life in the presence of God. Eternal peace and joy. And that life, that eternal life, commences the day He saves you. He gives you an abundant life, a joyful life. I beg you to repent and believe the gospel. I'm not giving you a scare tactic. This is a reality. You do not know when you're going to die. Just want to give you a few moments between you and the Lord as all heads bowed, all eyes are closed. For you to pray between you and the Lord.